أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In addition to Surah Al-Fajr tonight for those brothers and sisters who have their Qur'ans and their iPods and their iPads um, we will also be looking at chapter number 10 of the Holy Qur'an and we'll also look at Surah Al-Qamar chapter number 54 of the Holy Qur'an and inshallah these two um, particular chapters will bear verses that we will hopefully utilize tonight Salaam ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad قل مؤمنين والمؤمنات ثواب الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيدنا الممجد بشيرنا المصدق المصطفى الأمجد محمود الأحمد أبي القاسم محمد <تصفيق> وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعن الله ولا الظالمين من الأولين والآخرين أما بعد فقال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والفجر وليال عشر والشفع والوتر والليل إذا يسر هل في ذلك قسم لذي حجر؟ ألم تر كيف فعل ربك بعاد إرم ذات العماد التي لم يخلق مثلها في البلاد وثمود الذين جابوا الصخر بالوهاد وفرعون ذي الأوتاد الذين طغوا في البلاد فأكثره فيها الفساد فصب عليهم ربك صوت عذاب إن ربك لب من صاد فأما الإنسان إذا ما ابتلاه ربه فأكرمه ونعمه فيقول ربي أكرما وأما إذا ما ابتلاه فقدر عليه رزقه فيقول ربي أهانا كلا بل لا تكرمون اليتيم ولا تحاضون على طعام المسكين وتأكلون التراث أكلا لما وتحبون المال حبا جما كلا إذا دكت الأرض دكا دكا وجاء ربك والملك صفا صفا وجاء يومئذ بجهنم يومئذ يتذكر الإنسان وأن له الذكرى يقول يا ليتني قدمت لحياتي فيومئذ لا يعذب عذابه أحد ولا يوثق وثاقه أحد يا أيتها النفس المطمئنة ارجعي إلى ربك راضية مرضية فادخلي في عباده وادخلي جنتي سلوات Master of our age, Imam Zamana, my respected elders, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Our discussion yesterday brought us to the understanding that we have entered into the verse of Surah Al-Fajr at the point in which we are discussing the three tyrannical regimes that are mentioned specifically within that chapter. We have seen yesterday that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has presented to us the tribes of Ad and Thamud and also named to us Fir'aun. And we find that within these three, because we are looking at this chapter in light of the movement of Karbala to identify points where they can reconcile with each other, we found that we have to look at these three groups together in that, number one, if we are going to see them in light of the movement of Karbala, we have to see all three in light of the movement of Karbala. The second thing is the fact that we find that in regards to the tribe of Ad, we found yesterday that there is a verse of Qur'an that tells us that they are Adin al-Ula, that they are the first of Ad. And we found a Qur'anic principle that whenever you find the term Ula, or the first, or the earlier to be mentioned, there is always a second or a latter. So for example, 
we mentioned that there is a term where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say Jahiliyatil Ula and that in the Holy Quran this is a term for the first period of ignorance. The scholars appear to be unanimous in the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has stated that there is a first period of ignorance. There must be a second or latter period of ignorance. What one must do is to be able to identify which period it might be in. And then we also stated another example and evidence within Quran that we have Nash'atil Ula and Nash'atil Akhirah where we have the first creation, the one which we have already been born into, and then there will be a nash'atil akhirah, there will be a second or latter creation, being the time in which we are raised on the day of judgment. And therefore the precedent is set, that when there is adinil ula, there must be a second ad. And by virtue of us taking all three of these communities, these tyrannical leaders and ideologies and practices, we find there's not only going to be Adin al-Ula, there's also going to be a Thamud al-Ula. There will be a Fir'aun al-Ula. And therefore there will also be a second or a latter in latter generations of Ad and Thamud and Fir'aun. And therefore our goal over this section is to identify the characteristics of those three tyrannical groups and see how they have become manifested between the periods of Muawiyah and Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Yesterday we came to a point where we stated that the Holy Qur'an presents us with the characteristics of Ad. The community of Ad, they were within the geographical location of modern day Yemen. And they were a particular group of people who had Prophet Hud sent to them. In regards to Ad, we stated yesterday that they were of an area called Iram and that they were in a particular kind of mindset and that with their own lofty buildings with the grand buildings and cities that they had managed to create they felt that they were superior to anybody else and in fact anything else we highlighted a verse of Quran yesterday where they state who is greater in strength than us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds back and says are we not greater in strength, the one that created you in the first place? And therefore we found that this was an attitude. This was a way of thought. This was a thinking that we are the greatest in our civilization. We have not come across any that can rival and match us. Hence the term, hence the verse, الَّذِي لَمْ يَخْلَقْ مِثْلُهَا فِي الْبِلَادِ That there is none the likeness who have been seen elsewhere in such cities. And therefore because of Ard's arrogance, because of their belief that they were so superior to everybody else, that this was the point in which set a basis for the kind of tyrannical thought process within the mindset. We also need to understand this through the term and through the example of Yazid. We didn't have a chance to express this point yesterday because time was against us. But as such, we want to mention it today before we move on to Thamud. There is an incident that we are very well accustomed to that provides us with a very good example of the attitude of Yazid and how he felt that there was none above him and that how he was someone who was able to state that he was the supreme of all the supreme, similar and akin to what the people of Ad were like. We find that tradition that says to us in the events of Kufa and Damascus when the Ahl al-Bayt are presented in Damascus before him. Let us recall what the women and children must have been like. We know that they would have entered in in a state in which they were as captives. They would have had their legs bound, their arms would have been bound. They would clearly have been in a state in which they would have been hungry and thirsty upon their move. We would find traditions that tell us that the ladies would have been whipped and the younger children would have been slapped. Imagine this condition. And now imagine this condition upon the young four-year-old daughter being Lady Sakina, peace be upon her. When Lady Sakina stands in front of the enemy tyrant being Yazid, she begins to question and begins to discuss with him. She's in a state, obviously in absolute mourning. Yazid, one narration tells us that he addresses her and says, Oh little girl, tell me why is it that you are so upset? As if one would need to ask such a question. Tell me, what is it that you are crying so profusely about? 
And she responds by saying that I'm crying because of the state in which I find of my father. As the dialogue continues between this young daughter of Husayn ibn Ali alayhi salam and Yazid, we find it comes to a point where they now begin to discuss the stations of Imam and the station of Yazid. She puts out a statement and says that my father was the one was who my father is the one who is the Imam. He was the rightful heir and leader of the entire Muslim community. In a fit of rage, Yazid responds by saying, O oh little girl, your father enjoyed no rights upon me. Now this shows the level of arrogance that Yazid really had. That he was someone in his mindset akin to the people of Ad, where they themselves state that they have no one above them. They are the strongest of the strong. And even Yazid has this audacity within himself to claim that the Imam was no one who enjoyed any rights above him. Rather, as we know, the Imam was the Imam of the entire universe and everything would fall at his feet if only we understood how they were to fall at his feet. This is an example of what Yazid was like. And therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents us with Ad first because he wants to present an ideology a way of thinking, an attitude, a mental state of not only Ad, but specifically how Yazid would be akin to the thought process of Ad. Now we must move on to Thamud. Again, Thamud we are very accustomed to. We have heard the titles, and yesterday we mentioned that there are chapters that are dedicated by title to the history and the accountability of the people of Ad and Thamud. We mentioned yesterday, for example, in Surah Al-Ahqaf, now this is the sand hills, and this specifies the punishment that was given to the people of Ad. After the people of Ad had received their punishment in which the wind had blown and destroyed them and buried them over layers and layers of sand hills, it now came to their inheritors who were Thamud. Some traditions tell us that Thamud were either inheritors, as in grandchildren, or that they were cousins, and therefore later on being children and children of those cousins, but there was a family resemblance and tie between the people of Ad and Thamud. Therefore straight away we can see that they would become very aware, they would certainly know of the issue of their ancestors. Not only was this a famous story within Arabia, for someone to have been so close to the event itself, they would know first and second and third hand of the issue that would have destroyed the people of Ad. By virtue of this taking place, the people of Thamud decided not to stay in the area of Yemen geographically. They migrated slightly away from Yemen. They stayed within the confines of what we know today being Saudi Arabia. And they would have situated somewhere between the city of Medina and eventually where Syria is today. So geographically, if you get your mind map out, that will probably be somewhere in regards to the western or the northwestern side of Saudi Arabia. Until today, in fact, for those of us who are interested in history and archaeology and preservation of sites, the actual site of Thamud and their own area can still be found until today. If you and I go to those areas just northwest of the city of Medina, Medina al Munawwara, where we go on Ziyarat, if we still go today, there is a place in which you can still see the, the actual houses and the actual places in which Thamud were. Now this is actually something quite interesting because it's actually protected today under the UNESCO World Heritage Site. If you want to study this or look it up on the internet, you can just type in al Hajar archaeological site, Al-Hajr, like we have chapter number 15 of the Qur'an, Surah Al-Hajr, spelt very similar, Al-Hajr, archaeological site. Until today it still remains. Now we know the ideology of uh, our brothers within Saudi Arabia and the Wahhabi school of thought, and particularly the ideology in destroying everything and anything that is historical, and this is actually something that they were doing in recent decades. 
the idea was not to excavate. The idea was not to come and dig and see. Rather, it was to be left alone because it could lead us towards some sort of bid'ah or could lead us towards some sort of idol worship. Anyway, whatever happened, happened. And we find that UNESCO stepped forward and said, we want to make this a World Heritage Site. Since that period in time, with the good work of UNESCO, small number of digs have started to take place. And maybe one day, inshallah, we too can go and perform our own excavation and see the history of what took place with such an important period of Islamic culture and history. Why is this so important? Why is it that they would still be there? What houses did they have? The verse of Quran says, وَثَمُودَ Jabu specifically, that they were people who carved, that they were able to carve houses out of the mountains. In fact, if you go and look on the pictures on the internet, or if you get a chance to go, inshallah, you will see that their carved houses into the mountainside is very similar to that of the great city of Petra. We have seen Petra, and we have seen how it is dug into the side of the walls, and it's a very grand number of columns, and dig dug deep in towards the mountain. The cities of Thamud were very similar, maybe not as high as Petra, but very much similar in terms of how they would do it. The idea behind this from Thamud's perspective, the tribe of Thamud, was that they wanted their own security. Straight away we can see the link between the ideologies of Ad and Thamud. Ad created very lofty towers. For them, several stories high was grand achievement of technology for them. You can imagine thousands of years ago to build several stories high was an achievement. For them, they felt, Ad, that it was a protection for them. They could not be destroyed, nothing could touch them. Once the destruction and the sand hills came upon them, Thamud, the inheritors, had heard, had seen, were aware of this punishment and destruction that was labeled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They decided in their own arrogance, rather than becoming followers of the religion of God, what we will do is we will try to create our own houses which will grant us protection. So what they did was that they carved out great houses into the mountains, great houses into the side of caves, on the basis that they felt that this punishment that inflicted Ard could not inflict them. If they were already covered by lofty mountains, how can sand hills cover them? They will be fine by it. They wanted to protect themselves. Of course, as we know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if He wishes to destroy no matter how good the engineering is, in his own qadr, in his own desire of power, none can stop the destruction that will take place. Unfortunately, we even see it today. The height of engineering that we have within our world. Sometimes earthquakes hit the western coast of this country. Sometimes earthquakes hit Japan. These cities and engineers are specialists in building houses, in buildings that can withstand the quake, but yet sometimes they are still not capable of withstanding that quake. Imagine now Thamud, who felt arrogant enough to now state, we will build a new type of house in order to block the punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This being the case, this was their mentality. This is how they were thinking and how they were. It's interesting, the Qur'an itself provides us with an example of these two cities. And specifically the idea of these two groups of people that had achieved something within themselves that were unprecedented in regards to technology. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has that wonderful verse where he says, الَّذِي لَمْ يُخْلَقْ مِثْلُهَا فِي الْبِلَادِ by virtue of that wow atif, that wow that joins all the groups together, that verse is applicable to Thamud as well. Thamud were new in the way in which they were doing things, with the way they were excavating, the way they were digging into this land. We have to question as a thought process, what reason would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give me those verses in the 21st century? Okay, well fine. 
if I lived 1400 years ago and we were still very accustomed to traveling on camels and horses, then maybe, yes, I could understand the rationale behind giving me an example of a community that would also have traveled on camels and horseback. However, we live in the grandest cities in the world. What does Ard and Thamud, from an archaeological, from a technological standpoint, have to do with you and I in the 21st century? Or indeed in the 22nd and 23rd century? The principle in regards to these two verses are that they were great communities that had achieved the most in their time in regards to technology. None had achieved what they had managed to achieve in terms of their building, their structures, their infrastructures. Now, in fact, we can also claim the same thing. The fact that we are at the peak of history and the fact that there is nothing going forward except us now into tomorrow's history, nothing is there except us in our own technological achievement. We are the pinnacle of our own technological achievement, are we not? The beauty is Qur'an provides us with an interesting verse that shows us just how far we as a human species can go. One of the most famous verses of Qur'an, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ya ma'ashar al-jinni wal-insi in istata'tum an tanfudu min aqtal as-samawati wa ta'ala. O gathering of the jinn and the ins, if you think that you are capable, if you have the means, the capacity to be able to break through to the regions of the earth and the regions of the skies, then do it. But you will only be able to do it illa bi sultan, except by his authority or by his permission. Now let's get our thinking caps on, brothers and sisters. Imagine you and I lived 1400 years ago. Imagine we are Bedouins, we ride from city to city on camels. Quran asks, do they not even observe the creation of the camel? Imagine we rode on a camel and you and I were Bedouins and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed that verse to you and I. O oh, gathering of the jinn and the ins, if you think that you can break to the regions, break through to the regions of the earth and the skies, do it. How would you have understood that verse 1400 years ago? What would have been your understanding of your capability of breaking through to the regions of the skies? Would you have heralded, understood, fathomed that we could achieve what we have today? The interesting is some of the wording here. Ya ma'shar al-jinni wal-ins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses both the jinnat and mankind together and then tells us both of us are capable of diving to the depths of the earth and climbing to the heights of the skies. Now if you look at it, the jinnat and the insan, they are two completely different physical makeups, are we not? Although we may not have an absolute ultimate understanding of the realm of the jinnat, we are told that they are made of smokeless fire. You and I are not made of smokeless fire, we are flesh and blood and bones. Yet, yet, despite our differences in physical makeup, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that we're both capable of achieving something in this realm. And then he tells us, break through to the heavens, or the earth and the heavens. Look at the wording for heavens. Ya ma'ashar al-jinni wal-insi in istata'atum an tanfudu min aqtar as-samawat wal-ard. Aqtar, the root word is qatar. One of the translations for qatar is regions or countries. Countries. Qatar. If you think you are capable of reaching to the countries of the skies in the heavens, then do it. But you will only be able to do it with my knowledge or my authority. Fast forward 1400 years. Where do you think our understanding of that verse is today? Our technological advancement. Now fast forward another 200, 500 years. Where do you think our understanding of that very same verse will be in 500 years' time? And then imagine the awaited Savior, may Allah hasten his reappearance, returns. He spends however many years 
fighting, battling the evil. He conquers the evil. He is now the just Imam of the entire world. Everybody turns to him due to his piety, his knowledge, his authority. Do you know the hadith? Do you know how long the Imam is going to be in Imamat, open Imamat leadership governing the world for? Is he going to be for five years? Ten years? A hundred years? One of the hadith tells us the longest period the Imam will be in leadership for before he is martyred is more than 300 years. Now think about that as a timeline, this perspective of things. Imagine we go forward for another 200 years before the Imam comes. Just pick a number, whatever. And then he comes and then he establishes. And then he's in rule for another 300 years. That's 500 years from now. 300 of which will be in accordance with the Imam's absolute and divine knowledge on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What science and technology will human beings not be able to understand and reach the pinnacle of? Now understand this verse in 500 years time. O oh, gathering of the jinn and the ins, if you think you are capable of breaking through to the heavens and the earth, then do it. But you will only be able to do it with my knowledge or maybe my imam's knowledge. Now understand Ad and Thamud. Because they felt that they were the supreme authority of their knowledge of their time. And indeed they were. And there's not a problem with that. Technological advancement is the purpose behind human growth. It's part and parcel of who we are. The question is how our attitude is towards that technological advancement. Ad and Thamud were haughty and arrogant in what they had achieved. Whereas us as a human being, as a species, we either govern the things we create or we let the things we create govern us. It's completely different. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a deep prophecy about this issue and how when we create things, we think we are in absolute control of the entire world. For those of us who have that Qur'an with us, turn to chapter number 10, verse number 24. We'll give them time to find it. Sallallahu alayhi Muhammad wa Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts forward one of the most tremendous verses you will find in Qur'an. It is a prophecy. We hear of many prophecies in the Qur'an regarding room. The day of judgment is a prophecy itself. This is a wonderful prophecy that is made in Surah Al-Yunus. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillahir Rahman Rahim, the likeness of this world's life is only as water in which we send down from the cloud, then herbage of the earth by which men and cattle eat grows thereby. So basically the earth is nothing more than the rahmah we decide to give you. Our rahmah determines the quality of your earth. Don't think it's yourself. When we want to let you know a new technology, we will let you know a new technology. Yes, Steve Jobs achieved it. But where did he get this inspiration from? And indeed, a lot of it has been inspirational. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts forward this prophecy, this deep analysis of the human being and the potential of our attitude. Until when the earth puts on its golden raiment, and it becomes garnished. And people think that they have all the power over it. Then our command comes to it by night or by day. Listen to the wording. Until when the earth puts on its golden raiment. And it becomes garnished. And people think that they have power over this earth. The result of which when they think they are in control of this world, our command comes to it by night or by day. We render this world nothing more than reap seed produced, as if it has not even been in existence yesterday. We will destroy the earth as if nothing was left like it was yesterday. The wording is very important. He says the earth will put on its golden raiment and it will become garnished. Now, Let's use some of our imagery in our head and Google image. When you see a picture of this earth by night, and you see a country filled with its cities, which are filled with its lights, and you see an entire country by night, which is lit up by lights, 
Or you see a picture from space looking down and the earth is now of three primordial colors. You have that blue sea, you have that green earth, but you have that golden color from the electricity, all the lights that we have created, that emissions that we have created from the light energy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when the earth puts on its golden raiment and it becomes garnished. Now you know what a garnishing is. You know a garnishing makes something look very adorned and beautiful, like on a meal. How do you think the earth becomes garnished? Imagine the cities that we have today. Imagine the things that we have achieved. Just look at Dubai, for example. Has it not become garnished with the beauties of our technology? Our advancements in our achievements, alhamdulillah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says at this point, when the earth has its golden raiment put upon it, and when it has become garnished in this way, there will be people that think they have power and control over the entire world. You see here, it can't have been 1400 years ago, because Thamud lived within a few square meters, a few square kilometers, a few hundred square, square kilometers within Arabia. They didn't think that they had control over the entire world. Are there not people today who are so arrogant within their business, within their ideology, that they think that they have control over the entire world? At that point, we will show you our command comes by day or by night. You won't know when it comes. Maybe one part of the earth will be in night and another will be in day. And at that point, we will render this earth to become nothing like it was yesterday. It will not be able to be in existence as it was yesterday. We can't become like Adan Thamud as a human species. We continue our technological advancements. We progress to the point of perfection. But we must understand who it is that is allowing us to understand intellectual progress in the first place. Now you find an interesting comparison within Qur'an. Because if you turn to Surah Al-Zumar, chapter number 39, verse number 69, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says there will become a time in which it will glow. This earth will glow, yes. But it won't just glow from the human golden raiment that is put on it. The difference is, وَأَشْرَقَتِ الْأَرْضُ بِنُورِ رَبِّهَا There will come a time in which the nur of Allah will glow upon the earth. And at that point, the kitab of Allah will be set down, it will become firm. Prophets will be raised and people will be dealt with in accordance to justice. That verse is in order and in honor of none other than the awaited Savior, Imam al-Hajj, Ajr Allah ta'ala, Fajr sharif And therefore the ideology here, these verses of Ad and Thamud for you and I within the 21st century, is that we must understand how we observe our own growth as a human species. That we appreciate the technological advancements and don't use them to ruin us as a mankind. Now, we go back to the main topic. Ad and Thamud in light of Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Thamud, this group, as we stated, their understanding their attitude, their way of life was similar to that of Ad in which they felt that they were supremely protected. But now the difference was not only attitude, action. Their action was something akin to what Yazid bin Muawiyah would eventually perform throughout his time. There is an interesting series of verses and this talks about Salih alayhi salam, the Prophet of Allah who comes towards the people of Thamud. Specifically, the verses tell us that in discussion, he asks them and he says to them, why is it that you are willing to take bad over good? Why will you swap evil over purity and piety? Change yourselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes one thing in particular. And he says in answer, in response to this, wala yuslihun." That the people of Thamud did not perform Islah. They did not reform themselves. Here is one of the first and primary understandings between the linking of the issue of Thamud and Yazid bin Muawiyah and the movement of Karbala. 
we know the most famous of statement made by Abu Abdullah. As he leaves the city of Medina, he tells his brother Muhammad al Hanafiya, Inni lam akhruj ashiran, wala batiran, wala mufsidan, wala zalima, wa inna ma kharajtu utlubu al islah fi ummati jaddi Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. My movement, my entire movement of Karbala is not based upon me trying to rise for the sake of mischief or arrogance or causing a problem within the community. The only reason I rise, the one solitude reason I want to rise is based within the term Islah, reformation in the nation of my grandfather. Peace be upon his family. Here we see the first linkage. That the term within Qur'an for the people of Nabi Allah Saleh was that he demanded islah wala yuslihun and that they would not reform themselves. Here we can see something very interesting because we have a dua, or rather we have a ziyarat called ziyarat al-waritha. Ziyarat al-waritha is that salutation of the inheritorship based and dedicated towards the master of the martyrs. What do we say? Assalamu alayka ya waritha Adam wa sifatillah. Assalamu alayka ya waritha Nuh and Nabiyyillah. And so on and so forth. We go through all the prophets. Now in this standard ziyarat of waritha that we read on a Thursday night, is the term, peace be upon you, O inheritor of Salih, Nabiyyullah, there? No, it's not. We know it's not there. There are other prophets but the statement of peace be upon you, O inheritor of Saleh, is not there. Why is it not there? Is he not the inheritor of Saleh? Why were those particular prophets in the ziyarat picked and named by our sixth Imam salam, when he recited that ziyarat for the master of the martyrs? Was he picking only those because the Imam was only the inheritor of those Imams? Sorry, the Imam was only the inheritor of those prophets. Why did the sixth Imam choose those? Is it that the master of the martyrs was physically the inheritor of those prophets? He's not. He's not physically the inheritor of all those prophets. As an example, Assalamu alayka ya waritha Isa ruhallah. Peace be upon you, O inheritor of Isa, the spirit of Allah. Isa alayhi salam, according to our belief, did not marry and did not have any children. True? That being the case, how is it that Hussein ibn Ali, the master of the martyrs, can be the inheritor of Isa Ruhullah? Have you ever pondered this? We recite this ziyarat every single week. And tonight is Thursday night. And maybe will not be any different. Why do we say, Assalamu alaikum ya waritha, Isa Ruhullah, if he is not the warith of Isa Ruhullah? Therefore, it cannot be the physical inheritorship only. We're not speaking of the physical. We're talking about the mission of Isa Ruhullah. Peace be upon you, O the inheritor of Isa Ruhullah, for you are the follower of the mission of Isa Ruhullah. Therefore, when you see in Quran that Salih alayhi salam called for Islah, reformation, and his community, Wala Yuslihun, did not reform. And the Imam requested, made his movement based on one principal issue. Not movement in Quran, not necessarily the wearing of hijab, not necessarily X, Y, and Z. All those things come within the term of Islah, within the term of us reforming ourselves. And therefore, if the prophets were performing Islah within their communities, the Imam was also an inheritor of all of the 124,000 prophets and their missions. He was the inheritor of even Nabi Allah Saleh alayhi salam. This being the case, we find that again it provides us in evidence that the Imam's movement is in line with the story of Surah Al-Fajr. This being the case, what happened to Nabi Allah Saleh and how do we find the specifics of the issue of the movement of Karbala. Nabi Allah Saleh, may Allah bless his soul, started his preaching at an age of 14 to 16 years old, based on the traditions. And some traditions say that he lived up until the age of 120. 
And at the age of 120, he called for his own version of Mubahila. Again, you see another link, another comparison. Our third Imam was involved in Mubahila. Nabi Allah Saleh is narrated to have called for his own style of Mubahila. He says, You are worshipping idols, you are very arrogant. I want you to allow me and you to stand in front of your idols. Both of us will call upon your idols and we'll see whom they respond back to. Based upon your response, we'll know who is the right and who is the wrong. So they agree. The people, 70 of them, from the people of Thamud, go out into the desert. They eat, they drink, they bring the idols, and now they begin to call upon their idols. Of course, no response. Time and time again, they ask, no response. Nabi Allah Saleh is now given the opportunity. I will call. And he will call and no response from the idols. Nabi Allah Saleh says, if you have lost and you aren't capable of calling your idols, let one of us two call upon my Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we'll see if he responds to either one of us. The people of Thamud thought, well, if he, Saleh alayhi salam, calls, he'll definitely get a response. So let us call upon Allah and he won't respond to us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful that he calls upon even and he even answers the one who is the idol worshipper. So they say, we will ask for a she-camel to come forth who is 10 months pregnant. What happens? Nabi Allah Saleh says, well, I can't provide you this 10-month-old she-camel, but my Lord certainly can. No sooner had that request been made than the narration says, a mountain split in half And from there, a she-camel of red hair and complexion came out, which was 10 months pregnant. They said, Nabi Allah Saleh, make that camel give birth. And another tradition says that camel gave birth. At this point, this is one of the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we know, the she-camel of Prophet Saleh alayhi salam. What happens is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this she-camel is allowed to drink once every two days They will share their drinking stations And this point will be this time You will drink The next day my sign will be able to drink We will alternate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this clearly within the Quran in Surah Al-Qamar In Surah Al-Qamar He talks about the people of Thamud Belying his signs and he specifies and he says that this she camel of mine, you must give the opportunity to take and partake from the water itself. Can you imagine now if that she camel was supposedly to take water and be allowed to take water alongside the idol worshippers of Thamud? It makes an easy and obvious mirror image to the master of the martyrs and his family on the 10th Muharram and whether they were allowed to take water from the river Furat. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifies in Quran that one of his signs must be allowed to partake in water and share from a river, how can it be that the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would stop the sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being Hussein ibn Ali from partaking in water on those days as well. We see a clear comparison. It doesn't even stop there. As we know, what was the purpose of this camel? Why have this camel? Now, Salih alayhi salam used to go around and preach to other communities within that area. As we said, Thamud were within a region from Medina to Syria. Salih alayhi salam used to use that camel in order to go to various cities. When they hamstrung and killed that camel, they were stopping the progress of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's religion. They were the ones who stopped from that camel being the means of bringing the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the same way, when the armies of Yazid stopped Hussein ibn Ali from progressing to Kufa, it was exactly the same way that Nabi Allah Saleh's people stopped the progress of the religion of Allah. And Yazid's army stopped the progress of the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we find then, eventually, that the sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is killed in the she-camel. 
and ultimately even Hussein ibn Ali is also killed just like he is the sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore we find these parallels between Thamud and the issue of Yazid and how he was arrogant but not only taking on the same arrogance but he actually had the audacity to kill the sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one of the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely must be that man who had his arms cut off the first to have been given that title at tayyar the one who flies in heaven with wings such a man such a standard bearer for islam such a human being that not only is he worthy of being given this title in history Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam in his sermon presenting himself in front of the evil tyrant Yazid mentions Ja'far al-Tayyar as one of the signs from the Ahl al-Bayt. Here, this noble family produced such great grandchildren, such wonderful grandchildren in the example of Aun and Muhammad. Aun and Muhammad being youths, young children, young boys. Before we enter into the discourse and our understanding the sacrifice of Aun and Muhammad, I ask you to just take a moment and think about the Aun and Muhammad within your family. Think about the young eight and ten year old children within your own family. How small they must have been. How much they would have been looking forward to life. How much they would have wanted to serve their master. But on that day, when they were so thirsty, on that day when a lack of food was being given to them, on that day when the heat of the Iraqi desert was pounding upon them, and yet they had to wield heavy swords. On that day they had to bring and wear coats of iron in order to defend themselves from grown men. Can these be anything short other than the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala themselves? These two great pupils of Abu Abdullah, they were given the responsibility of fighting by their father. Their father was unable to come to the battle of Karbala. Some say because he was in a state of illness and some say because he was in a state of having lost his vision. Sayyida Zainab sallallahu alayhi when she had gotten married to him, when she had gotten married to Abdullah bin Ja'far al-Tayyar, said that we get married on the condition that when the time comes for me to move with my brother Hussein, that you do not stop me and allow me to go. Not only was this condition accepted, not only was this condition adhered to, but Abdullah bin Ja'far al-Tayyar went a step forward and said, if I cannot be there to defend Hussein on the 10th of Muharram, I send my two children on my stead. I send them on my behalf to protect the household of Rasulullah. On the 10th of Muharram, we find these two children eager, eager to enter into the battlefield. Where did this nobility come from? One narration tells us that on the night of Ashura, on that night, Sayyid Zainab is standing in a tent alone with her two children. Oh mothers, how must it have been to present yourself in front of your children and tell them, that tomorrow you must go out into the battlefield and not return. Sayyidah Zainab stands in front of her two young children and says to them, O oh, Muhammad, tomorrow you must defend your master Hussein ibn Ali. At all costs you must enter into that battlefield. And this was something upheld by these two lions on behalf of Hussein ibn Ali they come towards their mother and they say, Mother, we 
request permission to enter into the battlefield. We have seen our companions defending Hussein, our master, allow us to enter into the battlefield. At this point, Sayyidah Zainab comes towards Hussein and says, My dear brother Hussein, allow my children to enter. He refuses and says, No, how can I allow these two young children to enter? She returns back disappointed and says to her children, No, refusing the permission has not been granted for you to enter. But they come back again and again and again and ask and demand and ask to enter into that battlefield. Eventually they again go towards Hussein and say, Our uncle Hussein, our master, allow us to enter into that battlefield. How can I allow you when you are the apples of the eye of my sister Zainab how can I allow these two young children to enter into the battlefield when Sayyidah Zainab hears that he is continuing to refuse she says that this is what our what their father has asked and what their father has demanded take place at this point eventually Hussein allows them to enter Sayyidah Zainab sits them down and she says that you must go into the battlefield and addresses them. She begins to dress them herself and places these small turbans upon the heads of these two young children. Imagine now what Hussein must have done when he handed them their swords to enter into that battlefield. They enter into that battlefield and they begin to recite lines of poetry, each one of them. Owen turns round towards the enemies and he begins to recite about the valiant nature of his lineage. He says, Know that I am Owen, Ibn Abdullah, Ibn Ja'far al-Tayyar. He is the one who flies in heaven with two green wings. He is the one whom even the angels envy. You will find that we will attack you today. Muhammad begins to recite his own poetry. He says, You are the people people who have corrupted the Qur'an. You are the ones who have made a mockery of those verses which are muhkam and those verses which are mutashabih. We will attack you upon this day. The narration says that as they enter into the battlefield, they enter side by side and they begin to attack the enemies together. When they attack the enemies, they are situated together. The enemies come towards them, but they dispatch them just like the young family members of Ahl al-Bayt that they are. The enemies are being torn apart left, right and center until it comes to this point where Umar ibn Sa'ad says that you must separate these two children. Imagine what these two children must have been like upon that day. And when the enemies come and try to split them apart, I can imagine that when they were separated, Muhammad being the younger brother must have cried out to his elder brother and said, Oh, where are you, O oh my elder brother Own? For now the enemies are surrounding me. Where are you? Come towards my aid. And I can imagine the elder brother calling out towards his younger brother Muhammad. Continue to fight. Continue to come. Continue to go with perseverance. For we will be with you shortly. The enemies separate these two young warriors. And then they begin to attack them. A narration says that the first one to fall is young. Young, um, young Muhammad. Muhammad falls and the enemies begin to leave him in his final moments. He calls out to his elder brother, Own, come to my aid, Own, for your younger brother has fallen upon the plains of Karbala. Muhammad, even though he is so young, and Own, they are so young, they have such a close bond and relationship with each other. The elder Own comes towards Muhammad, he lifts the head of Muhammad and places it within his lap and begins to stroke the head of his younger brother. He says, Oh my dear brother, go towards your grandfather Rasulullah because I will be joining you in a few moments. Owen continues to fight and he too is struck down. At this point, what must the camp me have been like? How much pain must they have been in like to hear that final call towards Imam Hussein? Oh Hussein, come towards us and aid us in these final moments. 
one story, one storyteller tells us that in their final moments as they are traversing from this world to the next, Hussein ibn Ali comes running out towards the children. As he comes towards Own, Own tells him, Oh Hussein, go towards my younger brother Muhammad. When he gets towards Muhammad, he sits with Muhammad for the final few minutes. Muhammad passes away. He returns back to Own, but Own has already passed away. Own didn't even get those last few minutes with Aba Abdullah al Hussein. The narration says he brings these two bodies back towards the camp, and the narration tells that their small young bodies are dragging along the plains of Karbala. At this point, all the ladies come out towards these two children. Wa Muhammada, wa Aliya, wa Hasana. What has happened to these two young moons? What has happened to them? At this point, we look around, we ask, where is Sayyidah Zainab? Is she greeting the two young shuhada? Has she come out to meet her two young sons? No, the narration tells us she is in that tent. You will find her performing sajda towards Allah. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Praise be to you Allah for having granted me this opportunity. But it does not end there for Sayyidah Zainab. Sayyidah Zainab is such a monumental human character that she did not want to mourn her two young children. She did not want to mourn those two young children whilst there were other children of Ahlul Bayt to be mourned, whilst her brother was to be mourned. As she was leaving the plains of Karbala, they are taken between the bodies. They are made to walk between the bodies of Qasim and the body of Akbar and where the arms of Abu Fadl Abbas today eventually Eventually they get to the point where the body of Hussein is lying decapitated and the blood is oozing from the body of Hussein. Zainab falls towards the floor. She puts her hands underneath the body and raises it towards the sky. Ilahi taqabbal minna hadha qurban. My Lord, accept this qurbani from us. Oh Zainab, you didn't even say these words in regards to your two young children, only Muhammad. But even then, even then it does not stop. Because when Sayyidah Zainab returns back towards Medina, she goes back towards Medina and she goes back towards the place of her grandfather. Oh grandfather, oh grandfather, did you see what took place to Zainab? Did you see how they whipped me? Did you see how they beheaded your grandson Hussein? Did you see how they took our belongings? Even then she did not complain to Rasulullah about her two children only when she entered in towards her house her husband Abdullah was there at that point in time oh Zainab tell me about Hussein tell me about Abbas even then she did not complain about her two young children only until she entered into that room and she entered into the room of her house she looks up and she sees two small prayer mats pinned towards the wall at that point she calls out for Oni Muhammad oh my two children Oni Muhammad salutations be upon you for having defended my brother Hussein ibn Ali ala la'anatullah ya lal qawm al-zalimin wa sayya'lamu al-lazina zhanamu ayyum al-qalibi yanqalibun inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un ma'atami Hussein